I thought for sure you were going to be held hostage in her house thought, for days. And I we would never have you returned to America <laughs> from Finland. And in hindsight, you. in <laughs> hindsight, I realized <laughs> it was maybe not the smartest move, but she seemed so nice and so trustworthy. And so do. did this woman. I on... know. <laughs> Welcome to the Good News Showcast. I'm your host, Kimberly Dowdell. Join us as we shine a spotlight on the positive stories from around the world and within the special needs community. Should we go ahead and jump in, get started? Let's have you take it away. <laughs> this is serious, Kimberly. I know I'm trying to be serious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Good News Showcast. This is episode one. And today I am on with my Instagram husband, Devin, and my sister, Robin. Robin, how are you doing today? Good. This is exciting. We're so excited to have you. And of all episodes on episode one, Robin, for those of you who don't know your relationship to me, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? In relation to you? Yeah, I am. Okay. I'm Robin Gad. I'm Kimberly's younger sister. There are three kids in our family and I'm the middle. Kimberly's the oldest. I'm the middle. And then we have a younger brother, Michael. I live in St. George, Utah with my husband and five kids. Wow. And she's my favorite sister. And Yay. we'll hear a little bit more about St. George in the future in this conversation. And it's in Southern Utah. It's where all the red rock is. So what we do on this podcast is we highlight the good news in our lives. And a lot of that is going to be shared through individuals like Jack who have Down syndrome or other people with disabilities and just in general, good news. We like to share good news. And we thought we would start out by sharing our story today. And for those of you who are unaware of our story with Jack he was born with Down syndrome. He's now 13 years old. And 13 and a half years ago, my sister, I shouldn't even say 13 and a half years ago, but a little over 13 years ago, my sister had plans with her husband to come to St. George for her husband to run the St. George Marathon. And my husband had recently started a new job that required training in Chicago for eight weeks. And we thought it was possible that he wouldn't be there for the delivery of Jack. And it just so happened that he wasn't, <laughs> but my sister was. And so let's go back to that day on October 3rd, 2010. And Robin, I want to hear the story from your perspective. So go ahead and take it away. Yeah. So we, my sister and Devin, they were living in Cedar city, which is about 45 minutes North of St. George. So I had at the time three kids. My youngest had just was three months old. So we left our two oldest kids with Kimberly the day of the race. So she babysat for us. And then we made it back. We were planning on leaving Sunday to drive home where we lived was three hours north of that, of Cedar City. So we were thinking that we were going to leave. And Kimberly was just kind of like, in pain all day. She was having contractions, but she did not want to admit that she was having contractions. Like she was like, Oh, I just had a really big contraction, but I'm sure it's nothing. Like she just <laughs> yeah. wanted it to not be true. And all day I was kind of like, are you in labor? Are you going to go into labor? Should we stay? And she was just like, no, I don't think so. I'm not going to. So we kind of waited around all day. And I, in my head was kind of like, this would be so cool if Kimberly went into labor while we are here. But she was well, like, I was be... thinking <laughs> if I go into labor without my husband here, I'm going to be so mad. And so I kept <laughs> putting it off and telling people I wasn't in labor because I didn't want to do it without him there. While all along you were thinking, wow, this would be so amazing if I got to be there for the delivery of Kimberly's baby. I was. I was so excited because I had just given birth three months ago. I had never seen someone else give birth. So the thought of it was really exciting. But finally, about 6 p.m., I think we were like, OK, I guess we're going to go home if you're sure you're not in labor. And she's like, yeah, you guys can go. I'm good. So we get on the road. And I don't know, not very long after that, Kimberly calls me and says, 
do you think you could come back? And I think I am in labor. So <laughs> we turn around, we drive back. Kimberly and I get in the car. I drive to the hospital, leave my kids with my husband, including my three month old baby. Like, okay, here we go. Let's go to the hospital. So, and you I'm didn't driving. even know where the hospital was. And I by the no time idea. you got back to take me, I was in full blown labor. And I was having severe contractions that I could hardly even tell you how to get to the hospital. What yeah. convinced you to call her up finally and tell her to turn around? Well, we were living in um, my in-law's basement at the time because my husband had been going back to school. And my mother-in-law came down and she put her hands on my stomach and she was timing my contractions. And she looked at me very seriously and said, you're in labor you need to go to the hospital and you need to go right now. And I she think if she kids. hadn't have said that to me, <laughs> I would have delivered the baby at home. <laughs> Luckily she's had seven kids. I think she was pretty good. Or I would have dropped you. a shorty right there as we were walking into the hospital. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's go back to Rob and take me to the hospital. Okay. So we're driving to the hospital. Kimberly's giving me directions like in between contractions we get there. You probably remember these little details better than I do, like how far dilated you were by the time we got there. All I remember is that it was like, this baby is coming and this baby is coming really fast. So <laughs> we got into the delivery room and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. And Kimberly's just like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like she was definitely not at my same level of enthusiasm. I was just and mad. I was just mad when they told me I was dilated to, I was either a five or six. I knew there was no turning back. There was no had, turning back. You had no time for an epidural, right? Well, they gave me one, but I was progressing so fast that the epidural didn't even take effect until after Jack was born. <laughs> That's great. You got the, the worst case scenario <laughs> numb afterwards. In fact, the doctor told me after delivery, he said, if you have any more babies after this, I would recommend not even getting the epidural because you move so fast. Yeah. So it was super fast. And I remember just being so excited watching from the other side because I've never seen that, you know, miracle happen. And so Jack, he was born and everybody kind of whisked him away. And I remember he was, he was tiny, but he was also really like, purple, but I'd never seen anyone else's baby. So I just thought that's just and, how he is. Right. And being a husband that's been there three times, they always whisk the baby away. Yeah. But uh, well, what I think was that the was size? the thing is that Robin having, you know, only been the one who delivered a baby before and never experienced that on the other side. I mean, when, after you've delivered a baby, I don't think you pay attention to all of those little details the same way. You just, you deliver the baby and you're just so relieved that the baby is, is here. You did it. The worst part is over that you're not paying attention to those aspects whenever, of it. Whenever they whisked one of our kids away, I was like really high on adrenaline and I'd be right up there watching everything. And, and the nurses would go, can you give me a little room, please? <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't mention that I cut his umbilical cord. You I'm did. very proud oh, of that fact amazing. that I got to cut Jack's umbilical cord. I was you so did. just like thankful for the getting to witness the miracle of life coming into the world. And I knew it was really sad that Devin wasn't there, but. It was yeah, just I was like listening on a that's phone. true. I think I had you on speakerphone. <laughs> <laughs> Devin heard all of it, but I got to be I got to be Devin during it that. Was and to be experience. honest, I think that was the beginning stage of a very sweet relationship between you and Jack. Because yeah. I do have to say there is something about your relationship with him that I do not see with everyone else. I think everyone has you know, a special relationship with him, but there's something extra special between you and Jack. And I think that all goes back to those first moments and the fact yep. that you were there when he came into this world. Yeah. Okay. So they whisk him away. What, uh, what's going on there? So they were just kind of talking in the corner of the room, like in hushed tones. And Kimberly was kind of like, I think she felt like she needed to be in both places because you weren't there, you know? So she's kind of like, what's going on? Why are they, what are they talking about? And, um, we had some visitors come. So Devin, I think your mom came and at some point my husband came. I don't remember if it was that night or the next morning, but that night we definitely had a couple. And then the 
the pediatrician came to check on Jack. Mm -hmm. And after Jack was born, we were all kind of like, oh, he has the cutest little squishy face. I didn't see anything that made me think he has Down syndrome. I've never seen a Down syndrome baby born, but I never had that thought. Mm -hmm. But we were trying to see similarities. Like he kind of looks like Blake is what we were thinking because Blake has a cute little squishy face and did as a baby. I called my brother up to tell him we think the baby might have Down syndrome. Skipped a little head, but it relates. And he goes, how they know every baby looks like they have Down syndrome when they're born (laughs) with a squishy face. Right, yeah, their features are not. (laughs) I remember looking at Jack and thinking, something just looks different. But I, I too, didn't have a word for it. And I thought, oh, he's just really purple and he's extra, you know, squished up from, you know, just being delivered and... That's all that I thought. He was a lot smaller than your other He was so much smaller than my other babies. What what was his size? He was five Five pounds. Five pounds, 15 ounces. 13 ounces. 13 ounces. Yeah, five, 13. That's right. He's our smallest baby. (laughs) He was. Now, Kimberly, you heard something. Is it right around this time or is it later on when the pediatrician comes in? The heart murmur. So I was um, still on the delivery bed and they were delivering the placenta and I heard the nurse say, or uh, no, the doctor, as he's right there in front of me, he says to the nurse, is there a heart murmur? And she says, no. And that's when I kind of went heart murmur. Oh, good. Oh, good. I'm glad there's not a heart murmur, but I had no (laughs) idea why he would even ask her that, you know? But I think that was the first indication that something was off, Mm -hmm. but we didn't know what it was, but something was off. Looking back on it, we know a couple of things. We know that 50% of Down syndrome kids have a heart murmur. So if they have any suspicion suspicion that the baby might have Down syndrome and they are hearing a heart murmur, they're going to be like, we're probably right. So no heart murmur. They're like, well, we might be wrong on this one. But why they probably asked this, there's two other signs that they see. Um, one is the semen increase, which is a line straight through the palm of the hand. And, and, and most people don't. Now, your grandpa had a semen increase and he doesn't have Down syndrome, but all Down syndrome from what I've, I've studied have it. So you can, you can have a semen increase and not have it, but it's a really good indicator that you do. And then um, almond shaped eyes, they, they say, is another thing that they look at. So they saw almond shaped eyes. Low muscle tone. Don't forget the low, low muscle low tone. Low muscle tone, yes. So they probably saw those three signs, and that's why he's asking if there's a heart murmur. Right. Yeah. So then the pediatrician, I was still in the room. Kimberly's in the room. He comes to talk to Kimberly and is like, So I hear, I hear people saying he looks like Blake. And we're like, yeah, maybe, maybe looks like Blake. He's like, that's good. And, and we were then, thinking, why does he care so much? Why, why do no people care so much on. if he looks like yeah. his brother Blake? Why are they making such a big deal about this? Exactly. Why is he making such a big deal? And then he said, so there's a couple things that make us think he might have Down syndrome, but he probably doesn't. Cause you say he looks like Blake. He probably doesn't just. Don't even like forget that I even said that, but we're going to have to do some testing. And we're like, excuse me, what? (laughs) So Kimberly, she just kind of looks at him. I don't even think you started crying or anything, but you were like, okay. No, I felt like I was going to start crying and I was so exhausted and I was still angry that Devin wasn't there. And I was just trying to like recover from delivering a baby and then this doctor Here. comes in presents this news in the way that he did and i wanted to cry but i felt like i had to be strong and i didn't feel like i could cry and so all i wanted was i just wanted him to leave so then i felt like i could cry because crying with my sister was a safe place <laughs> and so that's when i turned and i looked at you with these unsure eyes like what like what now what do i say what do i do and then you turned to me and with confidence, you said, it doesn't it matter. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And yeah. that honestly, I, I have sat and reflected on those words many times through Jack's life. And it was the reason why you were supposed to be there. And it was the perfect thing for you to say to me, because in that moment, when you said that, I thought I had all these feelings rush through 
my mind of, you know, what value is he going to have in society? Are people going to love him? What is his life going to look like? It all just started, you know, playing throughout my mind with so much worry. And then you just said, it doesn't matter. And I thought, okay, we're going to be okay. We'll get through this. We're going to be okay. Yeah. I think I like instantly went into protective little sister mode and also like protective aunt mode. Like nobody is going to mess with this baby. You are (laughs) going to be fine. It doesn't matter. Like I am going to protect him because that's what little sisters do. Exactly. Is the doc, I understand because um, I got a call shortly after this and I was like, well, can I talk to the doctor? He's gone. Is he out of the room by the time you say that, Robin, or is he still in the room? He was still in the room. I think he was Mm. still in the room. So I said that and then, and then Kimberly said to him, so you just said that he might have down syndrome, but you also told me not to worry about it. So I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> like, is that what I said? That's funny. I don't yeah. even remember what I said. Yes. All that I remember is looking at you, you saying it doesn't matter. And then me just sitting there. I didn't even think that I had, I didn't feel like I had any words that could even come out of my mouth because I was in complete shock. I think the word is speechless. I mean, it happens to people in shock. And yeah. so I felt like I had all of these thoughts going on in my brain, but I couldn't get words to come out of my mouth. So I'm sure you the were like, wait, you wait, remember? No. Yeah, <laughs> that's I said what something. You said. I'm like, I said something. I don't re- even remember talking. I mean, you had to say something to him. So you're like, okay, you just said he might have Down syndrome, but you also said not to worry about it. So I guess and then I won't he worry about just it. abruptly left and he said, I don't know why I said that. I shouldn't have said that. Forget that I said yeah. anything. He probably doesn't. You know, we'll run some tests and we'll talk more tomorrow. And so it was, we were just left with this feeling of, and then he's gone, right? What do we do and with that? Gone. And then he, yeah. yeah, big news. Um, so Robin, I wanted to first tell you, thank you for saying that to my wife since I wasn't there. And, um, that is definitely why you were there. And I've always appreciated you said that. And if I was there, I would have gone to a logistical, <laughs> I'm going to take care of this and asked him a hundred questions. And I wouldn't have said that to my wife probably though I should have. So I'm so glad you're there. Um, but I want to kind of dive into to your thoughts on this. Um, do you remember your first thought when you heard the words Down syndrome by chance? I know this is a, this isn't reflecting on it later. It's this, you know, only at this moment within minutes of, of hearing it. So I don't remember like what exactly I thought. I just remember being really worried about Kimberly and how she was going to handle it. And if she was going to be okay, because I said, it doesn't matter. And I literally knew it would be fine. Like this Mm -hmm. baby's going to be loved. We are going to accept him. We're going to take care of him. I'm so glad that my kids get to have this cute little cousin, but I was really worried about Kimberly because this was not the baby that she planned on giving birth to like that she dreamt of for her whole pregnancy. This was not that baby that was in her mind. So, and as a mom, you could understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you have all these thoughts and dreams about your baby when you're pregnant. So then when you find out it's not what you planned, how do you, you know, how do you change course and go from there? And I just, I was just worried about Kimberly. I knew the baby would be okay. What do you, what do you think about what she said? It's kind of interesting, isn't it? She was thinking about you. I do think it's interesting because we asked mom the same question not too long ago and she said the same thing. And for whatever reason, I, in my mind, for a long time, I was so worried that Jack wouldn't be accepted, that people weren't going to love him and that he wasn't going to have a full life. And in my mind, I thought everybody was worried about Jack. And the fact that he had Down syndrome. <laughs> and so then when I talked to mom and now talking to you and hearing and that Michael. and Michael, Michael and hearing that everyone was worried about me, it's very, it's very interesting for me to hear. But also I, I appreciate that. And I think that says a lot about our family and our family dynamic because that's how we work. Our mom has always taught us to look out for each other and to be each other's number one fans. And we've always stood up for each other, regardless of the circumstances and what we're going through. And so I shouldn't be surprised 
that that's your answer. Even though I am surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean, been a revelation it's, for you. Yeah. It yeah. has. Well, it, it shifted and we all got really worried about Jack because he got really sick. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. going to go into that, but then we were super worried about Jack and his survival, but the whole time also just so worried about you. Like, how is she going to make it through this super hard trial? Mm -hmm. How do you feel your perspective has changed over time since those first initial moments that we had when we received the possible diagnosis to today? It's just been so fun because that first time was so traumatic. So we didn't know if Jack was going to survive, we didn't know how you were going to, you know, get your family back together. So every little milestone with Jack became such a miracle. And I think just it's taught us to appreciate the little things so much more. Even my own kids, when they were reaching milestones, you helped me to just be grateful for that because you don't realize what a gift it is until you have a child who maybe doesn't reach them as quickly as your typical child does. So with Jack, it's like still such a miracle watching him and being like, oh my gosh, look at him run. Look at him dance. Where did this personality <laughs> come from? Because when he was born, this little five pound helpless baby with low muscle tone, you know, we had no idea that that's who he would become. So it has just been a miracle to watch and still just so fun. And none of us will ever forget the miracles that we experienced and also the miracle of him coming to this world that I happened to be there. That wasn't a coincidence. There's no coincidences. No. And it's just, I think it's made us all more grateful for, you know, we have a belief in a God who orchestrates things for our good. And mm. um, Jack just helps strengthen that. I think that's so true. And we can see his hand in every step of the way from, I go back to when, um, you know, teaching my Zumba classes, being pregnant with him and telling participants that he was going to come out wearing a sombrero and dancing and, <laughs> and to, singing and singing to today. <laughs> that's literally what he does every single day is Step he sings oh, but... and he dances. And the fact that I was given that you know, tiny impression. I think that was preparatory for me, you know, giving me a little glimpse into his life and what his personality was going to look like. But yes, I think for sure, you know, there are no coincidences in life. And when you look at how, you know, God has a plan for each and every one of us, and we really ultimately are not ever left alone. And when you look for the miracles, you will see the miracles and you will experience the miracles and you will remember the miracles. And I'm so grateful that we have that, that we're able to look back and recognize those miraculous moments in his life. And even today, what the miraculous moments we still experience with him. You said over and over again, he's going to come out dancing and singing. And it, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't just once it was many times. It's and true. He, he just, I mean, he loves music. He loves dancing. He loves the movement. He loves everything about it. I, I he even sometimes wants two songs going on at the same time because he likes it so much. <laughs> I know it's hilarious how much he loves his music. So having been present during Jack's birth and being there with me to receive the diagnosis, how would you? Um, advise someone to give that diagnosis after I you've would, experienced it. Yeah, I would say to not come at it like it's a terrible thing if this is the case. Like he made it seem like we really hope this isn't true. We hope he doesn't have Down syndrome. Like he looks like Blake good because it just made right. it seem like this would be the worst thing ever if your child is born with down syndrome and that mm -hmm. is transferred to the parent like this is how society is going to view him as like this is terrible news so i think to not phrase it like that like practice in front of the mirror if you need to like <laughs> saying all the good things or like have a video of jack to show people like your baby 
might have Down syndrome, and I know this is a surprise and it's not what you expected, here is like what his life could look like in the future. One of the reasons why we do what we do with Jack and our, our social media is so that it inspires people like that because we had that in our life once. And I think yeah. that's perfect. I look back at that experience and I just wish that he had walked in more gently. And I wish that he had approached it in a thoughtful way, just like you explained. You know, we think that your baby possibly has Down syndrome. This is why. And if the test results come back positive, I don't want you to be worried because he's going to live an amazing life. And here are some examples of people I know or who I have seen who live a great life and have Down syndrome. But even if you find out a friend or family member has is pregnant with a baby with Down syndrome, don't say, I'm so sorry. Like, <laughs> say, congratulations. He's going to be so adorable. You know, you know like, just like you would because... any other baby. Right. I, it's interesting because I actually feel like other than the pediatrician, I feel like everyone in the hospital was extremely positive. I had nurses that would come into the room and um, they would tell me that I was so lucky. You are so lucky. This is going to be an amazing experience. And I felt guilty because I didn't feel lucky. And I was trying to let, process all of these thoughts and feelings and emotions. Plus, I'm hormonal. I just had a baby and I've got all these weird hormones going through my body and you're emotional anyway, after you have a baby and then receiving a diagnosis like this, it just compounds it. And it, it's just interesting because I don't think everywhere in the United States, but small town, Southern Utah, you are going to have nurses that are excited for you. They are thrilled for you. They're going to tell you that you're the luckiest. And they talk to you about a trip to Holland and how you know, you may not have landed in Italy, but you landed in Holland and the flowers are beautiful and there's so many wonderful things to see. You can go see Monet, <laughs> you know, and at the time I really didn't appreciate that for what it was. But now looking back, I'm so glad that I did have positive people who surrounded me while I was there and were trying to lift me up and make me realize that this wasn't a death sentence, that it was something to look forward to and that it was going to be positive. It just takes each person their own amount of time. You have to grieve for the baby that you thought you were having and then allow yourself, you know, to get to that place of where you are grateful for where you are and you're excited for the journey ahead and you're not sad about it, but everybody takes that at their own pace. And it wasn't until, you know, maybe like a few weeks after Jack was born, I actually had someone say, it's okay to grieve for the baby that you thought you were having. And once somebody said that to me, I had this overwhelming feeling of like, oh, I'm normal. This is okay. <laughs> and I'm going to be okay. You know, but luckily I was surrounded with a lot of positive people. And that's one of the reasons why we like to talk about this and highlight it because what you go through in the first minutes, days, and maybe weeks is different than how you're going to feel after that. And we, for sure, this is like the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. But in those first minutes, it doesn't feel like that. So we don't, we want someone that experiences the same thing, not to feel shame and to be like, no, everyone goes through this. This is, this is the process. Right. Um, so that's really important. Robin, how do you feel your relationship with Jack has evolved over the years and what have been some of the most rewarding aspects of being his aunt? So you mentioned this, that Jack and I have always had a special bond, and I feel like that is so true. Um, soon after he was born, I guess he was almost one, my family and I moved across the country to Nashville, Tennessee, and broke my it heart. Was it was so sad <laughs> because we finally were going to live close to each other. And then we had to move, but we made a big effort to come back to visit a lot, to plan family vacations. And somehow, and I prayed for this, like I did not want my kids, my kids to lose the relationships they had with their cousins. And Jack knows us. He knows mm -hmm. our names. He looks forward to seeing us. And he does. You know, I feel like we prayed so hard for him for the first couple of years of his life. We still pray for him, but it was like he had health challenges and 
when you pray for somebody that hard, you can't help but just love them so much. And also just me seeing him born just made me love him so much. So I think he feels that. But Jack, he just has like an innate spiritual sense. You know, he, um, I think he knows when people know and love him and he is not fake. Like he is not <laughs> going to act like he likes you if he doesn't. So I yeah, know that's that so true. you get what you get with Jack. You get what you get. So I know he loves me. I know he loves my kids and my husband and he knows us. He gets excited to see us. And I've just been so grateful that my kids have him as a cousin and that they have gotten to know him as a person. Like they don't talk about Jack with down syndrome. It's just Jack. He just, yeah. he's just Jack. He's just a part of our family. And he has just like they have their unique personalities and quirks. So does Jack. And mm -hmm. he adds so much to our family. So I'm just grateful that they have this relationship with a person who has down syndrome, but that's not how they see him. So it makes them right. more open to, meeting other kids like that and being friends with them. And when we were in Tennessee, I put my kids in a preschool where they would be peer models for kids with oh, special mm -hmm. needs. I remember and, that. And it was partly because of Jack. I was yeah. like, I want <laughs> them to have this experience where they get to be friends with these other kids. And then my, my son, as a teenager, he worked with, it was called special needs mutual where he would go weekly and have activities with kids where he was a friend of one of them. And he just looked forward to it every week as a teenager. We had a hard time getting him to do like anything, but he never complained about going to this night every week. So I mm. feel like having Jack just, it made us more open to the love that we could have in our lives because of the love that those kids are able to give so much more than the rest of us, which we all it, need to be better at. It's interesting because our second most popular video on YouTube is failed hide and go seek, which is one of these visits <laughs> where you guys drive into town and Jack is so excited to see you. And I think people see that love and that interaction in that video. And that's one of the reasons why it's got like 6 million views. So that's, it's, it's really fun. That was a really sweet moment. <laughs> Jack does love to, he loves his people and he loves them hard. And he lets you know how much he cares. Just like it like comes through his body, through his mouth, through his smile. <laughs> like it just emulates outside of him. And I think like Robin said, that's something that all of us could learn to do better in our lives is to is to love that way. And the thing is, is that he's honestly, he's just himself. That's who mm -hmm. he is. And I think a lot of times young kids or even as adults, we, we get a little bit self-conscious about who we are and we feel like maybe we need to act this way or not say this or do that differently so that we can be accepted. And here he is just being himself and it's the best person that he could be. And I think that's a good lesson is for all of us. It's just be yourself because that's who people love and that's who they want to spend time with is you. They don't want to spend time with anybody else. They want to be with you. Yeah. And sometimes I think we don't give love as strongly as Jack because we're scared of how the other person is going to take it or maybe they don't reciprocate it. Like, why not mm -hmm. just go all out and show how excited <laughs> we are to see somebody? Why not? I agree. And I think that's so true. It's one of the things that people see online about him and they just love and it makes them date. We The most common thing we get is I watch Jack's videos and my day is turned around from, you know, whatever it was going to be to a really positive experience. We have a lot of people say, this makes me want to be a better brother or sister or mom and dad, which is really great too, because they want to just let it all out there like Jack does, like you just said, and, and uh, don't hold anything back. I think those are my favorite comments. I love it when we get responses like that. Okay, Robin, last question for you. How do you think your experience with Jack has influenced your understanding and perception of individuals who have Down syndrome? So anytime I see someone with Down syndrome just out in the world, you know, I want to go either give that person a big hug. I usually don't. I should. 
or their mom or whoever's with them and be like, I'm a part of your club too. Like it feels like a really (laughs) cool club to be a part of. And I'm not a parent of one, but I feel like I have kind of lived it through vicariously through you guys. And, um, and I was there when he was born. So I am officially a part of the club, but I just, I understand what they've gone through. I understand how hard it probably was when they found out their child had down syndrome, but I just think they make our lives so much better. They make our world better. So I want to at least like, even if I don't go give them a hug, I make sure I make eye contact and smile and say hi. And I'm just so grateful that they're in this world because they are just, they, like you say all the time, they're born without the misery gene. They're just, Mm -hmm. they're born happy. And we all need more of that. It's so funny. You said that we were out to eat a few weeks ago and I was walking to the restroom and walking in front of me was a man carrying a baby probably to go change her diaper, you know, in the, in the changing room and the baby had down syndrome. And so I'm walking behind them and I wanted to be like, kind of the same thing. Hey, guess what? I'm part of your club too. You know, yeah. but I didn't want to like creep him out because I was walking behind him. So I just said, your little girl is so cute. And he kind of turned around like, thanks. Like how weird you're walking behind me and you just complimented (laughs) my baby. And then I went to sit back down and I said, Devin, there's this guy who just walked by and he has a little baby with Down syndrome. So then he, we're both sitting there waiting for him to walk by (laughs) so we could maybe like make eye contact because we did have Jack with us and be like, Hey, look, we have one too. (laughs) Yeah. It's an interesting phenomenon that whenever someone like before we had a son and we didn't have a lot of contact with someone in the down syndrome community. You kind of felt like, Oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. But once you have a baby or you're really close to one, like Robin, it's like, you want to meet every one of them. You want to talk to them. You want to hug them. You want to ask them how it's going. And um, it, it's like, it happens to everybody. It just happens to everybody. Isn't there a gentleman that has a Instagram that's almost based off of that? Like you're, you're, you're a Down syndrome father. I'm a he Down does. syndrome father, and they go run into each other. <laughs> that's, that's how it really is, though. Once you ha- once you experience it on the level, it happens to everybody. Because it's like the son said thing. You both just get it, and then you mm-hmm. automatically feel like your family because you just get it, which is really cool. There's... Well, Robin, we're so glad that you could be here with us today we're on our done. podcast. Oh, we're not done? No, oh. I have questions. Oh, Devin's got more questions. <laughs> My gosh. Put this off. We got Robin for we're an hour. We're going to have to cut that part out. It's okay. It's, um, oh, what, one of the things I was going to say is for anybody listening, the most cuddly, cutest little thing is to snuggle with a little tiny baby with Down syndrome. Their low muscle tone. The best. Is it's like I want everybody to be able to experience that. It just one. melts into your body. <laughs> um, one of the questions I wanted, um, for my wife tried to cut me off is <laughs> Rob, do you remember maybe any experience or your earliest experience with anybody with Down syndrome? Yeah, so in the neighborhood that we grew up in when we were little, there was a girl, her name was Ricky. And she Mm. had Down syndrome and she, it was kind of short lived, but I remember her coming to my house and playing with me every day for, (laughs) I don't know, a month or two. And I looked forward to it. I don't think I really even understood that she had Down syndrome. I just remember that I had this new fun friend who would come play with me. Yeah. Her name was Ricky. Do you remember her, Kimberly? A little bit. I remember coloring pictures with her on the porch. Yeah, but I don't think my mom made a big deal about her having Down syndrome. It was just she was just our friend girl Ricky who came over to play. Yeah, I can't see your mom making a big deal about anybody. She loves everybody. She does. No, she loves everyone. Um, in California, do you, yeah, did you have any experiences? I'm just curious. Not that I remember. I mean, mm. well, we yeah. went to the same high school and junior high. And I don't remember meeting anybody in high school, or junior high. And we, I don't yeah. remember seeing any kids with special needs at our schools other than me. I mean, even autism wasn't talked much about 
I might, might have had one or two friends that were a little bit on the spectrum, but um, they, they didn't, they definitely weren't diagnosed at the time. Um, but elementary school, my, my elementary school was right next to a, um, a school that was dedicated to special needs. But um, I wish we had that experience in high school. There was a boy that went to church with us. His name was Darren Peterson. He didn't have Down oh. syndrome, but he had special needs. And my dad, our dad, loved him. So we loved him because our dad loved him so much and always made a really big deal about him and made him feel loved. And he was an adult, I guess. He worked at Taco Bell, but we just, we loved him. We all loved Darren. Darren, you know, he wanted to drive and he wasn't allowed to get a license. So his favorite thing was to go to the go-kart park. And that's where your dad would take him all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say that's where dad would take him so he could experience driving. Go drive fast and, cars. Man, he's just like Jack on that thing, man. He loved doing that. <laughs> He'd be so happy. He would do his classic Darren would jump up and give your dad a hug with all his feet wrapped around your dad. Yeah, and, the biggest you know. hug. <laughs> I'm looking at that experience now. Um, you know, dad did that because he loved Darren mm -hmm. and he loved spending time with Darren and he wanted to make Darren happy because when you saw Darren experience joy, you felt joy. And now having a child with special needs, I see that from the parents perspective and how meaningful that probably was to Darren's parents mm -hmm. that people would take the time out of their day to come and pick him up and take him out to do something that he really loved and enjoyed. And I think that's a good lesson for individuals who don't have a child with special needs as a way to look out for those individuals in their own community and to be a friend and make opportunities for their children to hang out with these kids, invite them over. Um, you know, we have kids in the neighborhood who will come and take Jack out to play basketball or they'll take him out to go get a Slurpee because he knows they know that he loves that. And every time that happens, I am always just so grateful that someone took the time to acknowledge that Jack wants friends too, and that he wants to have fun experiences, like playing basketball with friends, just like anybody else. And I would just encourage other people to take notice in doing that and find those people in your community who need a little bit of extra TLC and just even if it's just sitting down and spending time with them, coloring pages in a coloring book, it doesn't need to be spent at the, you know, writing go-karts. Anything simple means a lot. And I think just like realizing they're more alike, like we are more alike than we are different. You just have to look for the similarities. Like mm -hmm. Jack loves to play basketball, just like so many other little kids do. You know, he loves music, just like we all do. He loves movies. He loves Slurpees. He loves fast cars, like mm -hmm. so many things that we, that we all like. So I think people need to not be afraid to get to know someone with special needs, to not be afraid to get to know someone with Down syndrome and not be afraid of asking questions from the parents, like what's his diagnosis or what, mm. you know, just don't be afraid to ask because they would rather have you ask than sit and stare or point or, you know, I agree. I agree. Any opportunity that arises that gives you a chance to talk to the parent and learn about their child. I think the parent is always more than willing to answer those questions so that they could, it can open the door for opportunities of friendship and, and love. Every parent with a kid with special needs that we've ever met, their their worst nightmare, or maybe their top three worst in the top three of worst nightmares, is usually number one is their kid being mistreated. It is the greatest worry for most people with kids with special needs. So when you see someone doing something like what your dad did for Darren, or just taking the time to, to take someone out to basketball, or or get them a Slurpee or just ha hang out with the kids in the front yard. It means so much to the parents. It does. Did you have any more questions for Robin? Yeah, I got more questions. Robin, <laughs> we've been talking about your experience with, with, uh, <laughs> with Kimberly and the birth, which is um, a really good experience for other people. Um, and people usually see you dancing with Kimberly and, um, what I'd love to talk about is your Instagram. So what is your Instagram about? So I 
our whole family growing up was kind of obsessed with like the weird health stuff. <laughs> our That's parents a had it. Can, can we name a couple <laughs> just for fun? Just for fun, our parents drank every day some the most disgusting thing you will ever put in your body. It was called Herbal Fiber Blend. It was. <laughs> well, I think it actually was good for your body, but it tasted disgusting. It was thick. It tasted it was disgusting. Gritty. It was. It, was, it was literally the worst tasting thing. And I am not a picky eater. Devin thinks lots of things are disgusting. <laughs> I <laughs> think most healthy foods are really good. This was disgusting, but they drank it because it was good for them. So that's kind of how we grew up. Like you do things that are good for you. So I am a certified integrative healthcare practitioner. So I am very focused on the just holistic health. I do epigenetic hair scans for people where I pull a couple of their hairs and put it on a little scanner and it sends the information that it gathers to Germany. And then a report is generated, a 37 page report that gives them kind of priorities to focus on with their body. So mm -hmm. I like talking about if they're experiencing health problems, I'm not a doctor, but we can try to see maybe what the root cause is before, you know, they take bigger actions or and i know the answer to this but i don't think everyone listening to but why <laughs> the hair why do the hair you know so the hair holds a lot of information it's kind of like if you look at the trunk of a tree if a tree's been cut down you can see the rings on the tree that tell a story about the tree's life so you can tell if there was an extreme drought one year or um, if maybe bugs got to the tree one year, you can tell what happened to the tree by looking at the rings on the trunk. So the hair is like that, where it tells a story of what's happening in your body for like the past 90 days. So not the whole life, not your whole life, but it'll give you a good picture of not just what's happening at this exact moment, but what has been happening environmentally and in your body. And then it um, can tell you what things you can prioritize to for your own health. So it's so an cool. interesting experience is Kimberly had somebody that got her to use happy juice. Is it happy juice? It's happy juice. Yeah, happy and, juice. I mean, we're, we're big fans of it. I can tell you as a husband, when she started taking it, I could see a huge difference. Um, but it's not, I don't, um, you know, I want, I want people to know, but it's not necessarily selling it. It's just, I've sell, I sell a lot of things and happy juice is supposed to help you with your gut health. And the lady that had given it to Kimberly had been using it for a while and you did a hair scan for her. And what was her gut like? How the yeah, hair so scan you're given, back? everybody has like, you get scores for different parts of your body. So like mm -hmm. the immune system, one of the pages is your gut and you want to have a low score. So the higher the score, the higher support needed. Her score for gut health was the lowest score I have seen. And I've done hundreds of these hair scans. It was the lowest number, like just maintenance. You don't need to work on your gut. So, <laughs> and everybody has gut problems. So that's when I was like, okay, there must be something to this. Happy I, juice. I, that's really I only say though. that because I saw the great effects on Kimberly. And then the lady we know that had been taking it the longest scored the best on gut health with you. And that's when I was like, well, this hair scan really works. Cause you, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, it's crazy. It was, um, now I can't turn Instagram on or um, without seeing something about gut health. It's become very the the topic of conversation and many things, and I'm a true believer in it. But what um, part of what you've done is focus on gut health as well. So you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So your gut is like your immune system is housed in the gut. If you have a healthy gut, it's going to affect everything else, like your hormones, your um, your skin, your how you digest and absorb food. So mm -hmm. with a lot of my clients, when we do a hair scan, I have them do a different test that it's like a baking soda test. I have them drink mm -hmm. baking soda first thing in the morning. It tests their hydrochloric acid so, levels. So, so act as if no one knows, cause I'm not too sure about the baking soda. So tell us what it is. Okay. So first thing in the morning before any food or water and anybody can do this, you take half a cup of filtered water and mix it with half teaspoon baking soda, drink it on an empty stomach, and then you set a timer to see how long it takes you to burp. 
and you want it to be like a good size belch, not just a bubble. <laughs> so if it takes you longer to burp, then it could be that your hydrochloric acid levels are low. So then we want to focus on healing the gut. And as mm. we focus on healing the gut, then oftentimes it helps fix a lot of the other problems they might be experiencing. You know, we live in a culture with um, a lot of anxiety, depression, um, a lot of autoimmune and what, you know, we're not doctors here, but what we've all become to understand is that the gut has a, has a larger um, effect on that than we thought before. Um, but one of the things you talked about was uh, acne, acne and uh, skin care. And, you know, I've always thought it's kind of odd that we treat it all with why, you know, keeping our, our face clean, which obviously helps. But um, it's interesting that there's been a lot about the gut um, health, how it affects the skin care. And I think that'd be important to a lot of people. What, what have you learned about that? Yeah. So I, I mean, I've noticed it personally. I had a lot of acne um, as an older, like teenager in my early twenties, I had really pretty terrible skin and it wasn't until I got older that I realized that the things that I eat directly impact my skin. And now I can totally tell if I haven't been like focusing on all these things, then I will still break out occasionally. But focusing on what you eat and what you put in your body, it has a direct impact on how you look physically and how you age. So if we want to stay healthy and young, then we should really pay attention to the things that we're putting in our body. And yes, good skincare is important and it helps, but starting on the inside helps even more. I, I can't, it just makes sense to treat it both ways, you know, try to get the oils off your face, but also the, you know, your inner um, part of it as well. And as we're talking about hair scans here for a minute, um, I did have Robin do a hair scan for me and leading up to that hair scan, probably the year before was when we were planning a wedding. I was under an extreme amount of stress planning my first daughter's wedding. And then um, I think when you did the hair scan, we had just recently, or we were about to send Luke off on his mission. Yes. Yeah. And again, I was under an, a lot of stress. And I think the hair scan showed that I was under a lot of stress. And um, you talked to me about what I could do to help change that. But then also I had been talking a lot about how I just felt like my hormones were going crazy. <laughs> and the hair scan showed that I needed to improve my gut health and that I needed um, assistance probably with my hormones. And so I thought I'm going to start with my gut health first because your gut is where you produce your hormones. Is that correct? Are they so. housed in your gut or something like that? Right. I don't know. I'm not a health expert here. And that's why, that's why I started taking the happy juice because I thought if I can heal my gut, then probably a lot of these other symptoms that I'm having that showed on my hair scan will either go away or they'll be lessened. And so it'd be interesting to do a hair scan now to see where I'm at, because I have noticed an improvement in my overall health. I haven't been sick at all this year. Um, I do Which feel a difference unusual for us with all kids in school. Yeah, and, I do feel a difference hormo winter. hormonally. I've noticed a big difference and I don't feel like I get as anxious, which I think that's where those stressors were coming from that showed up in my hair scan. So I think there's a lot of good that comes from having those hair scans done to take a deeper dive into your, your health holistically, maybe if you don't want to just go on all these different pills and how you can look at um, maybe fixing or adjusting some things in your life holistically before you, you know, possibly go on different treatments or drugs, I guess, yeah. as you well, could sometimes say. Sometimes it's like medication is more of a band-aid, you know, like let's just treat the symptom, but with the hair scan, it helps you get to the root cause. Like, why are you experiencing these things? Even when we were talking about Jack and you were talking about processing emotions, sometimes emotions comes up as the number one priority for people. So they have to learn mm. how to like validate what they're feeling, recognize what the emotion is, and then do something physical to move it through their body, whether it's breath work or I love tapping, uh, meditation, 
something physical that actually moves those emotions through because if they get trapped in your body, you know a lot about this too, but um, then that can make us sick too. So many things can make us sick, but there's ways that we can learn to heal. Our bodies are amazing. I love that. They are amazing. And when we're healed and when we're whole, everyone else around us is happier as well because exactly. we're, we're nicer to be around. <laughs> um, you know, to that point, I was listening to a doctor and he said, I got really excited about fixing someone's mental state because I realized it wouldn't just affect them. It would fit, it would affect their, their spouse or their loved ones and their children and their children's children. And, um, so, you know, I, I, you see how that happens. Um, also, yeah, like you said, you're not a doctor, but the hair scan is just, it's going to look at what's going on with the hair. And like you said, it's kind of like a history of what's going on in your body as long as your hair. And, um, but it helps focus a conversation with your doctor and think, say, Hey, yeah. you know, I think this might help me. What do you think? Um, and, and, um, cause you have a very short time with the doctor and sometimes that ability to say, Hey, I think I could really use some help, you know, with, with the, my hormones or, or da 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 da. And it, it can get you the help you need. So, yeah. It's a really good starting place. It's a good mm -hmm. way to, you know, start a conversation. It doesn't diagnose anything. So you can't get a hair scan and find out if you have cancer or Hashimoto's or, but there are some, but if you focus on the priorities that it shows, it's still going to help heal you. Cause it could say you're low in magnesium, you're low in vitamin C or your B vitamins. And mm. even without knowing a diagnosis, you can start healing your body. Now, Robin, I wanted to talk about something that very few people know about you. But you know, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> one of the hardest languages there are to learn, which is what? Finnish. <laughs> you, you're blonde, blue eyed. You look like you're from Finland. I look Scandinavian. But, yeah. Yes. But you were not born there, right? No. Um, how hard would it be for you to say, um, Tell Finnish people they should watch our show in Finnish. Could you do it? I know you've been away from it for a while. I know. I used to be really good at speaking Finnish like 20 years ago. Now I can understand a lot of it. But um, let's see. Let me. I have to think for a second. I put you on the spot. So You did put me on the spot. I would have had this <laughs> you, totally perfected if you I'm told She also you speaks you Spanish, and I bet well, she could say it in Spanish first. <laughs> yeah, Robin probably. also knows a lot of Spanish. It, it, pretty yes. amazing. Katsotan tata. Tata. I said, watch this. <laughs> okay. Cool, because we're going we're gonna to cut this and send it in YouTube to our Finnish friends. Yes. Okay, I'll have Robin. A, I'll, next time I'll have a lot better phrases prepared for you. Yeah. We got a few more minutes. And what I want to go to is can you tell everyone about your tr little trip to Finland? But I want, I want you to focus on the lady you met because Kim and I laugh at this <laughs> and laugh at this. So I was a missionary in Finland years and years ago. And finally, after being married for almost 20 years, my husband went with me to Finland. I've, I've always wanted to take him there. He served in Guatemala and we've been back several times, but it's a lot harder to get to Europe. So finally we were in Finland. We were, I had everything planned out. Google maps is amazing. Would tell us exactly what bus stops to be at. But once we were traveling from Helsinki, which is the capital to the old capital, which is called Turku. So we were, where Google Maps was telling us the bus stop was, but it wasn't the normal system because it was a further trip. So we were trying to figure out how do we buy this ticket? So there's this lady standing at the bus stop and she can hear us speaking English. So she's like, do you need help? <laughs> so <laughs> we're like, yes, we do. We're trying to go to Turku. And so she was like, that's where I'm going. So she helped us get on the bus. We had to figure out how to buy our tickets. It was this big kind of ordeal, but she like, walked us through it, helped me get the app I needed and get our ticket spot. So she's sitting behind us on the bus. It was like a two hour ride. And she just, I think she was excited that we were from America. You were Americans. Been, we were Americans. She wanted to talk to us. So she just kept, you know, talking to us. She was super sweet. She was like 60 ish, but very young, hip looking. And um, 
So she's like, well, what are you doing while you're here? So we kind of told her our plans. And she said, well, what are you doing Sunday? I could drive you around and show you some stuff. So we're like, oh, yeah, Sunday maybe would work. (laughs) So we invited her to come with us to church, which she didn't. But she picked us up at the church. So she like found us on Facebook Messenger and was messaging us. So she picked us up from church, drove us around. We went to lunch and then you haven't gotten to my favorite part yet then she took us to her house is this your favorite part (laughs) yes yes (laughs) she took us to her house made us lunch and was like well both of us we just had jet lag so we're like falling asleep in the car as she's driving she's like you need a nap so she showed us upstairs in her house and showed us a little place we could take a nap so the complete stranger We totally went and took a long Sunday nap in her house before she took us to the train station to go back to the station. Now, we we found out about this story after they returned home. Oh, she Had we known this, did she text us us the story? Yeah, she texted us a picture of them napping at her house. Oh, that's right. That's right. And I thought for sure this was going to be a situation like that movie. What what was that movie that we watched with Michael that... um, Um. She Bates. finds Bates is in it and she takes the guy like he's the author and that she ties him in the bed and beats him up. I forgot well, what, what is the name of that movie. Anyway, oh. I thought for sure you were going to be held hostage in her house thought, for days. And I we would never have you returned to America <laughs> from Finland. And in hindsight, you. in hindsight, I realized <laughs> it was maybe not the smartest move, but she seemed so nice and so trustworthy. And so do. did this woman I on, know. in the yeah. movie. Well, I'm glad I'm glad it was a great experience and you did wake up and you were allowed to leave her we house. Survived. And, yeah. And we have you here today. Okay, Robin. But truthfully says something about Finnish people and yes. how thoughtful and kind they are because in America or the United States, I'm not sure that people are that forthcoming that. with inviting strangers into their home and showing them around town. So it goes to show like something about their culture and the goodness that, you know, is innate yeah. in each one They're of them. They're pretty quiet, but once they decide you are their friend, you are their friend for life. So I still randomly sometimes get messages from this cute lady. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> yeah. She's a sweet lady. Her name was Seiya. Seiya. Okay, well, that uh, should do it. I would appreciate you. And again, I want to tell you thanks for everything you did for my wife when Jack was born. Appreciate you. He's the best. <laughs> yes, thank you for being our first episode of the Good News Showcast. And before we say goodbye, do you have any final thoughts? Just that I'm so thankful for you guys and I'm so thankful for Jack and just the, he really is who you see online. And I'm so grateful for the love and joy he's brought into my family's life, into my life. I love talking to him. I love when I answer the phone and it's Jack and he says, Robin, (laughs) like he knows my name. He knows all of our names and that just like makes you feel really special. So I'm very grateful for that. He's in our family. What a blessing. That we get Everyone to have Everyone should feel that special. Yeah. Everyone should. It's true. It's true. I love that. Well, it was so fun talking to you today. Until next time. Okay. Bye.